Good morning, everyone. Welcome to church. We are continuing on in our weeks and weeks of series on our why. Woo. You recognize this? And today I get the opportunity to talk about why. Woo. Hell. Yes, we can say this word in church. It is a destination that we will be talking about. We are a Bible-believing church, and we believe the Bible teaches that you will be destined for one of two locations in the afterlife, heaven or hell. And specifically, we're talking to the question, why do good people go to hell? And this is a question that a lot of people have asked and a lot of people have struggled with and really thought with inside themselves and so I am honored to get to speak to it today and I my prayer is that after this sermon you would be filled with hope and an urgency inside of you so let's before we go any further let's pray God I thank you for this day and I thank you for these individuals that are represented here Lord I pray that you would give us clarity to hear from your word, God. Um, I thank you that your word is true. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I pray uh, that the power of your word would get inside of us, Lord Jesus. Change us today, God. I thank you that we all represent different walks of life, God, and I thank you that you meet us right where we're at, God. So meet us today. We love you and glorify you with this time. In Jesus' name, amen. So a lot of people, the general idea of hell is that all the good people go to heaven and all the bad people go to hell. It's like we've created Santa's naughty and nice list for the afterlife. <laughs> naughty Bobby, who gave you wet willies in junior high, is destined for hell. <laughs> or naughty Dan, who dumped you and got with that other girl, he's probably going to hell because he's kind of a jerk. Or you know, maybe you've made a few rough decisions in your life, but overall you're a good person. You gave to that charity at Christmas time, so you're probably bound for heaven. We have this good people go to heaven, bad people go to hell. And so we have this mentality created in our culture that if I just do things good enough, then I'm, I'm destined for heaven. And that is not what scripture says. Why do, bad, why do good people go to hell? Today we will be answering that question. Good people go to hell because there's only one way to heaven. And if they don't choose that one way, then they're destined for hell. There's one way to heaven and every other way to hell. So I'm going to look first at the very beginning. In Genesis chapter 2. If you want to turn in your Bibles with me, that would be great. If you don't have a Bible... Pretend you do. We're in church, people. <laughs> but the Lord God warned him. This is God in the beginning. He created the Garden of Eden. Adam, he's commanding Adam, but the Lord God warned him. You may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So before sin had entered the world, God warned Adam, if you eat this fruit, sin, you will be sinning against me, and death is going to come into the world. Death was never a part of God's plan for man, but, God, but man chose to sin, and death entered the world. So we're going to look at that continuing on in Romans 5. This, <laughs> I am not a technology person. All right, Romans 5, verse 12. Turn in your Bible to the right. Okay, no one's turning. Um, chapter 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. So Adam's sin marked in humankind a sin nature. So when we are born, we are not born in, with this godly nature. We are born with a tendency, we are born with a sin nature, which damns us all to hell, which damns us to death. God said from the beginning... If you sin, your penalty is death. And so when Adam sinned, he brought that death upon all of us. Continuing on in Romans 5. I will get this one day. Verse 15. <laughs> it says, but there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam brought death to many. He brought death to all of us. But, every, but even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness. 
to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. And the result of God's gracious gift is very different from the result of that one man's sin. For Adam's sin led to condemnation, but God's free gift leads to our being made right with God, even though we are guilty of many sins. So when Adam sinned, the relationship with God there created a breach between man and God. And God's wrath was in the middle of it. Justice had to be made because of this, this breach that we have. And so when Adam sinned, he condemned all of mankind to damnation and hell. But God loved you so much that he wanted to fill this breach, that he sent his son, a perfect man, a sinless man, to die, to take that death penalty that we have as sinful beings, to take that place for us as a perfect being, he can take that, that place for us and die so that we can be removed from the penalty and we can live in freedom and have eternal life with him. And so when it's talking in Romans um, 5.15 about God's gracious gift, God's love enabled him to graciously create a plan of salvation for you and for me. He instituted this plan to remove the penalty of death, the penalty of eternal hell over our lives. Continuing on. For the sin of this one man, Adam caused death to rule over many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death. Through this one man, Jesus Christ. This one way, this one man, Jesus Christ. Yes, Adam's one sin brings condemnation for everyone, but Christ's one act of righteousness brings a right relationship with God and a new life for everyone. God's, Jesus' one act of death and resurrection, showing his authority over death, enables us to have right relationship with God. So where that breach between man and God is, is open, God is the bridge so that we are able to foster a relationship with God, may, be made right with God as he intended. When Adam was right with God and he breached that, Jesus is bridging that for us, for mankind. But this is the only way that we get to experience eternal life with him. In John 14, 6, it says, let's turn in our Bibles there. Is everyone doing okay? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Great. It says, I am the way, I am the, this is Jesus talking, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. This is one way, this is the only way we can get to the Father, through Jesus Christ, through Submitting and acknowledging his death and his resurrection, his authority over Christ, being subjective, being subject to his sacrificial penalty, through sacrificial death for us, taking that penalty away. In, uh, in 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, and 9, it says, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. So those who reject the good news, the good news, the gospel, is Jesus' death and resurrection and our um, opportunity to get to respond to that. To those who refuse that, they will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separation from the Lord and from his glorious power. This is hell, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't accept Jesus Christ, you are damned to hell. Regardless of what you've done, regardless of what you're doing, that is how good people go to hell. In Galatians 2.16... It says, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, by believing in the sacrifice that he paid for you, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For, for no one will ever be made right by God by obeying the law. 
No, you cannot be justified by obeying the Ten Commandments. You can't be justified by doing good things. The only way to be justified is through faith in Jesus Christ. And in John 3, 36, it says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, eternity in heaven. But he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The wrath of God is removed when we acknowledge Jesus in our lives, but if we don't, that wrath abides on us. When we accept Jesus, Jesus looks at us as being removed from the penalty of death. He looks at us as being free from sin. But without Jesus, we are all he sees is his wrath. He sees the sin, and we are destined for eternity in hell. It doesn't mean you're going to die and that's it. You're going to die and you're going to be imprisoned in eternal hell. It's horrible. Or you can be destined for eternal life in Jesus, with Jesus in his presence. I want to illustrate this point with a story. That there is only one way to Jesus. There's only one way to eternal life. And it's not about being a good person. It's, about, it's through Jesus Christ. And I want to tell you a story about a woman named Sheila Wilson. She was born in Corvallis, Oregon, and she grew up in the same city that she raised her family. She was a loving mom and a loving wife. She was known in the community for being someone that would throw fundraisers every year and raise tons of money for their homeless shelter. In fact, they had a tradition every year that they would drive around the city and find someone that was homeless or in need and invite them to join them on the Thanksgiving dinner every year. She was also the best baker. Her son's soccer game, all the kids would always look forward to the fresh baked cookies that she made after the game. And on January 24th, 1989, this incredible woman with talents, and love for people and love for her family died when a semi brakes went out, hit her car and smushed her against a building. She died on impact. It was a significant loss to the community. On that very same day, January 24th, 1989, another person died. This man grew up with a normal childhood. He had friends, he was charismatic. People liked him. He was a liar. He was a thief. And he was a serial killer. He killed over 30 innocent women in his lifetime. These are two distinctly different lives. Yet only one of them made a decision. And in our cultural and human way of thinking, it would be obvious who would be entering into the presence of God that day. But Sheila, growing up, was invited by her friends to go to church. She went to church a few times and was offered, with, presented with the opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of her life, to accept his death and resurrection over her. But she was always too busy and didn't really think she needed that religion, didn't think she needed that relationship with Jesus. And she was presented with that opportunity as an adult. In fact, she let her kids go to church with her family friend, but she was always so busy. She was a great person. She had a ton of things to offer the world, but she never made that decision. And Ted Bundy, who a lot of people have heard of, he killed over 30 women, innocent women. He was crazy. And on January 24th, 1989, he was executed in the electric chair for being convicted of the murder of a 12-year-old girl from a playground. 12 hours before his death, he had an interview with Dr. James Dobson where he confessed that Jesus was his Lord. He had accepted Jesus' forgiveness over his life. Ted Bundy entered heaven that day. It doesn't matter what we do. We don't have to be good. 
we just have to accept, respond to God's plan of salvation for us. Because he loved you so much, he wanted to remove that penalty from you. And so many of us get caught up in being busy or thinking we just need to be good enough. I don't know who, who lied to us and told us that being good enough to go to heaven is the way to heaven. It's not. It's the one way through Jesus. And something that's significant about this story, in uh, Matthew chapter 20, there's a parable. So if you want to turn there. Actually, I'll just tell you it. It's kind of long. It's about laborers in a vineyard. And the, the vineyard owner hired at dawn, he hired men to work in his vineyard. And they were going to work for a denarii, which is a, a, way, a day's worth of wages. And they came, and they were working. And around lunchtime, he saw more people wanting to work. So he invited them, come, I'll pay you, work in my vineyard. And then near mid-evening, there were some more people that needed to work. And so he said, come, work, I'll pay you. So these people had been working at different lengths of time. But at the end of the day, the vineyard owner offered them the same wages. And this is the same with the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter if you're 65 and have had a horrible life. God still offers you that salvation freely. It doesn't matter if you are Ted Bundy and you've killed over 30 women and the day before you've, your execution, you choose to accept Jesus in your life, he still offers that to you. Because grace, in his grace, this undeserved gift of freedom that we talked about in Romans 5, it's for you, regardless of when you do it in your life, when you choose to do it in your life, it's for you. And it's the one way that you can spend eternity with him. So today I want to encourage you, if everyone could close their eyes and bow their heads. Good people go to hell every day. Bad people go to hell every day. Good people go to heaven every day. And bad people go to heaven every day. It's all about the choice that you make to choose the one way. And that way is Jesus Christ. If you haven't made a relationship with Jesus, it's more than being saved from hell's flames. In life, it gives you purpose and hope of the life that's yet to come. And if you haven't made this choice, I want to give you this opportunity today. And I'm going to pray over you, and I'm going to invite the prayer team after to come up and meet with you and pray with you. I want to also challenge believers to have a fresh urgency. You hold the key to life, and so often we withhold it from other people. God, I pray over this body, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would speak your life and your truth into each one of us, Jesus. I thank you that you are the way, you are the truth, and you are the life, God. And I pray that over those people who are receiving you for the first time today, Jesus. What a celebration, God. I pray that as a body, we would not be able to contain it, Lord God, but that we would be filled with urgency to spread this good news, Lord God, that we would be vessels used by you, God, to bring about salvation in the world around us, Lord God. We love you, and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. So come forward, those that love. Okay.